Could we know Jesus was special before he was even born? That's what we'll find out in Matthew 1. Hi, this is Jill from the Northwoods. I am so glad you're here. I've been planning this for a long time, and I'm glad we're finally getting started. Just a quick moment of housekeeping. I am moving web hosts right now, and it's the most unfortunate time when you're starting a new podcast. This first week or two might be a little weird. There might be times when my site's not available, but then it'll come back. So if you missed an episode, please download it again. And then once the website is back and up and running, we're going to have blog articles for every episode of this podcast. If you don't know me, I was an atheist for the first 22 years of my life. I spent two summers in Israel. And after talking with my friend and witnessing, with the grace of God, I became a Christian and have been since that time. Maybe you're like me. You've always wanted to understand the Bible a little bit more in human terms. Sometimes people feel so far away in the Bible. I mean, they're far away in terms of time or far away in terms of culture. But you know what? The more I read the Bible, the more I realize these are just people. People were people all the way through the course of time. So that is my goal, to bring these stories, this message of God, this single plot culminating in the story of Jesus to us so that we can understand God, what he wants from us. We can understand the people of the Bible, what they were facing, why they did the things they did, and what were the ramifications of it. These are very human people in human situations. My grandma sent me to Israel because she worried that I was becoming an atheist and that I didn't believe in the Jewish things that I was raised to believe. So she hoped some trips to Israel would help me gain some connection. And it did. It absolutely did. I spent an entire summer on an archaeological dig in Ashkelon, and I found a dog cemetery. You can Google it. Pet Cemetery, Ashkelon. It's really weird. But we got to go on tours of different dig sites when I was there, and I learned so much about the history, the people, the places of that time. When we had free time, we would usually go someplace fun, and we stayed in the old city of Jerusalem. My friends and I stayed at a convent. It was only like a dollar a night to stay overnight there. And I'll tell you the real reason we stayed there. It was the only women's bathroom in the entire old city of Jerusalem that we could find. But the nuns were great, and they would show us the history of this place, about how Jesus was there and was crowned the king of the Jews right there. One of the things I found is that as an atheist, you think everything is just gibberish. None of these people existed. None of these places existed. And then you go to Israel and you say, oh, the tunnel of Hezekiah, which was written about in Kings. There it is. Oh, Jericho, the walls blown out. No, it's not that city. It's the one over there. That one has the walls blown out. Pontius Pilate, that guy never existed. Oh, there's a plaque with his name and title on it. You start seeing things in the Bible happened and the places are there. So my goal in this story through hard chapters and easy ones is so that we can understand the Bible better. If you didn't get a chance, please listen to episode zero of this podcast, where I talk about what's going to happen with this podcast, why I'm doing it, and what kind of tools are going to be available for you so that you can follow along and do your own study. I'm going to have what I call the ramps format for this Bible study which stands for read. This is where we're going to read the passage. I'm not reading it to you. You'll read it on your own with whatever translation you want to read it on. Then we're going to analyze the passages. I'm going to fill out the worksheet with a lot of information. It'll be available for you to download for each chapter of the Bible. If you want to do a deeper dive, please feel free. This worksheet is for you to fill out. M stands for meditation. So what does this passage mean to me? When thinking about the things I heard about God, the nature of mankind, what should I do with my attitude, my actions, the way I think about the world? Is there something I need to change? Then P stands for prayer. What things am I grateful for? And what things do I have concerns? What am I going to bring to God after reading this passage? S stands for share, which means sharing this information with other people whether it's people who haven't heard the good news of Jesus, people who have been in the church for a while, and maybe this will be interesting and educational to them. Maybe if you have questions, it could be a pastor, a priest, or an elder. 
So after this template is complete, it'll be available for you to download in a couple of different formats, and then you can fill it out on your own. There's also a blank word template if you want to fill out the entire thing by yourself. All right, so let's talk about Matthew 1. First of all, let's talk about the authorship of this book. Everyone believes it is written by Matthew because it was clearly aimed at a Jewish audience. It's also someone who saw many of these events firsthand. He was named Levi as well as Matthew because he was probably from the line of the priest lineage going all the way back to Jacob. And then he called himself Matthew, which to me feels like a bit of rejection of his tribal family. Became a tax collector. Being a tax collector was a good paying job, but it also meant people hated you. Nobody likes tax collectors, right? So you took in money for the Romans, and then sometimes the tax collectors kept money for themselves, and they were considered to be traitors working with the Romans. So this meant he was probably well-to-do and also not liked. He was most likely educated in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and he knew the scriptures, the prophecies of the Old Testament. In the TV show The Chosen, interesting, they sort of make him to be on the autistic spectrum a little bit, maybe like a nerd or a very smart guy who is very tuned into details. We'll see more of that when we start reading Matthew. He also talks about money and gold and treasures more than the other apostles. There's no signature at the end, but from the earliest church fathers, they believed it was written by Matthew, and they were closer to that period of time. When he starts out, he does the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That means we're going to go back through and trace the family of Jesus. And when you grow up Jewish or in the temple, you often hear the genealogies repeated many times. It's a big part of being Jewish. Particularly, you'll hear in the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Being in the line of David is also very important because the Messiah is supposed to come from the lineage of David. So he comes right out, tells us the lineage of Jesus. And in this particular book, it's the lineage of Joseph. We're going to get to Mary's lineage in Luke. Now, the reason this was important was because everything came in through the lines of sons. Property was transferred through sons. Businesses, if your father was a carpenter, you would be a carpenter. If you were a landowner, that property transferred to sons and responsibilities transferred through sons. The other thing that's interesting about how Matthew talks is that he goes through this lineage, these prophecies, he never explains any of it. It doesn't seem like he's writing this for the Roman reader, the Greek reader, because he doesn't say what these prophecies mean. He doesn't say what these lineages mean. He just goes on and talks about them as if you know. So that means that this was written for a Jewish understanding who would understand who all the people are, what all the prophecies are, and what was expected. The Greeks and the Romans didn't have any care who Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob were. So unfortunately, I called this particular area of the Bible the begat. That means who birthed who? Who was the mother, the father, that line of family relationships? In King James, the word begat means gave birth to, fathered, mothered a particular child. And so I never liked them very much. I got bored with them. It's unfortunate that when you're starting off with the Bible in a brand new year, there you are, ready to read the Bible in a year, and then you get to the begats. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. You know, the whole thing. And so then you're like, oh, goodness, why do we have to go through this? Here I am, excited to start the Bible off, and this is terrible. I mean, to be honest, it's one chapter. We could all survive it. So mostly I skipped over it. I didn't really think about it. I never read them with the eye that I read them this time. And now I get it because we knew Jesus was the line of David. That was going to be the whole prophecy right there. But then when we start talking about all these people, which we're going to do when we get to the Old Testament, they all have really interesting stories. They all had hardships. They all had triumphs. Some of them were good people. Some of them were bad people. Some of them were rich and kingly, and other were lowly and nobodies. There are a few prostitutes in there. There are a few people in there that are not Jewish, not from the tribes of Israel. And so you have a mixed bag in the whole line of Jesus. And the interesting thing is, 
that there are three sections of 14 generations in Matthew's lineage description. These are not literal generations. There are some people missing in it. Sometimes there are grandparents instead of parents. The concept is that seven means a completeness in Hebrew people. Something is seven days, it's a complete whatever it is. 14 would be doubly complete. And so having three generations of 14 total completions is very, very complete. But the ultimate completeness was the 49. And the reason that 49 was so very complete is that if there were slaves being held, think of slaves as more indentured servants, which means that they were either paying off a debt or hoping to get something for their service. People were let go from that obligation. Jesus is the last portion bringing us up to 49, which is going to be that seven times seven to indicate that the indentured servants, the debts that are owed to God are being now completed. And that's because of Jesus. So in this line of the three generations of 14 are some people that you may have heard of, like Abraham, Jacob, King David, King Solomon. But there's my CV, some people in there too that you've never heard of. And I mentioned there are people from all different backgrounds, all different faiths, nations, people groups, men, women, everyone's in this particular group. This means that the plan of Jesus coming to save us includes everybody. It's not just the good or it's not, not the bad or it's just not the rich or not the poor. It's everybody. Jesus' plan includes everybody. And then eventually we get to the father of Joseph and then Joseph, who is the adoptive father of Jesus, the husband of Mary. It never says in there that Joseph is Jesus' father. So we know that God is the father, not Joseph. But his obligations, his lineage coming from David is still in the line of people. And that completeness is found in this last generation. And then the other side would be Haifa, which is a port city along the Mediterranean Sea. So this is in the north, halfway in the middle of the country. It is believed to be the hometown of Mary because, and that she grew up there. Joseph comes from Bethlehem, which is why we're going to see him travel to Bethlehem for the census. They were betrothed in the story, which means they were engaged. But engagement is a very serious situation in those days. You probably took your vows, you were promised to each other, and any sort of contract that was written over the marriage was probably fulfilled. So meaning if you break an engagement, it is like a divorce. But it means that they also didn't share a marriage bed yet. They didn't live in the same house. They probably were not allowed to be unchaperoned with each other. But in the eyes of God, they were bound together. Once the marriage ceremony would have happened, then they would have been fully man and wife. But Joseph finds out that she is with child. And it says in there that he is a just man and he didn't want to embarrass her. He didn't want to call her out in public, which would mean that she would be stoned to death. She would be thrown out of the city. Something would have happened to her that was going to be terrible. So he decided he was going to divorce her in quiet so that no shame came to her. But then the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him, called him son of David, there's that lineage again, and told Joseph to take Mary as his wife because the baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit, God, that the angel said she will bear a son and they're going to call him Jesus because Jesus means he will save, meaning his people. And all of that takes place so that we can fulfill the prophecies. And so what does prophecy mean? It means at some point, someone, usually a prophet, was given a sneak peek into the future. Spoiler alert. And they were told to tell other people about this so that they understood when they saw the times coming, they could understand what's about to happen. Sometimes people believed in the prophecies and stood fast to God, and other times people didn't. They would lose faith and lose heart about the whole situation. There are a number of prophecies in the Old Testament, and we're going to go through all of them. But again, it mentioned that Joseph was a holy man, and the holy man could either mean someone who we think of just as a holy guy living in our town, or it actually could mean that the person was a wise man, a educated man, almost like a rabbi where people went to him with problems. 
We're not sure which one of those things it is. So then we go back to the prophecy. In Isaiah 7.14, this is where it talks about a virgin is going to bear a son. He will be called Emmanuel, God with us. So this was an important prophecy in looking for the Messiah. So people had a clue when the Messiah was going to be here. There were people who followed that all through the (laughs) hundreds of years that it went from prophecy to prophecy to prophecy to then 400 years of silence, which is from the end of Malachi in the Old Testament to now Matthew talking about the birth of Jesus. There was a 400-year gap. So in some passages, the word that's used for virgin can also be maiden or young woman. That it means all the same thing back in ancient times, because if a young woman or a maiden was found not to be a virgin and she wasn't married, again, she would be put out of town, her reputation would be over, and she had no future. Maybe she, again, she'd be stoned to death. So it meant all the same things. And in this particular case, Matthew uses the word parthenos, which is a Greek word. And the parthenos means a woman who never had sex. That part is very clear as compared to the Hebrew word. In Greek mythology, if you've ever heard of Athena, she was also known as Parthenos because she was a virgin. Think of her temple, the Parthenon. So we get that word was something very special. Matthew wanted this to be very clear. And it's important because there are people who try to take down the Bible, don't believe in it, or they want to remove anything that's supernatural. They want the Bible to just be about a very good man who was born from this lovely couple who changed the world. But in this case, it's very clear Mary was a virgin. So Joseph wakes up from his dreams and he does what the angel of the Lord commands him. He takes Mary as his wife. And then Matthew just blurs over this whole story, which we'll read about it in other gospels. She gives birth to the son. This is going to be in Bethlehem. And it says that they didn't know each other, meaning they didn't share a marital bed until Jesus was born. And so that's it. That's chapter one. So this is the analyzed part of the Rams study. So to continue with the analysis of this chapter, we saw some references to Isaiah in this chapter. There were three people in this chapter, Mary, Joseph, and the angel of the Lord. The events take place somewhere between 6 BC and 4 BC because you tie it to historical events. Namely, Herod's death is a major milestone in this particular story. And there's some records of censuses being done at that particular time. Also, this was probably around summertime. I know we celebrate Christmas in winter in the Northern Hemisphere, but when we look at when the sheep are in the field, when census times are being taken, that usually happens in summertime. So most likely this was in summer. Some of the main themes that we find here in this chapter is putting Jesus in a time and a place. He's not just some sort of random mythology. He's a man that lived in a time period. And he came after three times 14 generations of people. The story of God continues throughout this entire plan. And the interesting thing about it is, is if you ask some of those people in that line, maybe not the kings and the queens, but maybe some of the prostitutes, some of the lesser known people. Hey, do you know you're going to be in the line of the savior of mankind? Most of them would have said, hmm, I don't think so. Do you know who I am? But it means that God uses people that never expects this is what's going to happen. Whether things go right with that person, wrong with that person, they're great, they're lowly, they're terrible. God will use you in his plan and that plan won't be diverted. The interesting thing is, is when I was in Israel, the wall around Jerusalem that you see now, there's what's called the Golden Gate. And the Golden Gate is where Jesus is supposed to return and enter Jerusalem in triumph. There's a cemetery right outside the Golden Gate, and the Golden Gate is sealed up. This is in what's called the Kidron Valley. And this is a valley between the Olive Grove, where Jesus spent time praying, and then you go down through this very steep valley and into the city of Jerusalem. And then the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, rebuilt the walls in 1541. They stay that way in the way I saw it. Suleiman also decided to put a cemetery right there. And it's because of a misunderstanding about how the priestly class works, just like Matthew is part of the priestly class. 
they were not allowed to cross through cemeteries, and so he believed that this would prevent the Messiah from coming back. If thousands of years won't stop the Lord, if good people and bad people and all the history that happened in between won't stop the plan of the Lord, (laughs) isn't that amazing that we think we can stop God and separate him from his people? So the takeaway from all of this is if we feel separated from God, we now know we're not. We're part of his plan and that we should love him for always looking out for us and always, no matter what circumstances happens along the way, continuing his plan. So my meditation is going to be, I'm going to meditate on how God has a long view of history and is always looking out for us. He is making this plan in action over the course of time. If we feel that the world is out of control, which it often feels that way, it's part of the rescue plan God put in place to save us from everything. And he cares about us enough to continue that work. My prayer of gratitude is that we have a God who has a long view of history and a plan in place to save us all. And so my plan to share this information is for when people feel that they're not fitting in or that things are too much out of control, I'm going to let them know that God is looking out for them and continuing his rescue operation. Now you can reflect on the rest of the RAMPS guidelines. Again, you can download it from a couple of different locations. I'll have the links in the show notes. We're going to take our RAMPS up to God, see what I did there, and fill out the sheets. So next time, we're going to read chapter two of Matthew. Thank you for joining the podcast. Please tell a friend, tell your Bible study, let your church people know so that they might be interested in this slow roll, the Bible in small steps that we could do together. Thank you for listening.